Before I go into Nancy, a little bio about Nancy, I want to just tell you who is sponsoring this, this event. Um, it, the Haven Center for Social Justice at the University, um, that's what the organization I represent. But also, and I just lost my connection. What is your name? Oh, Patrick Barrett. Um, that, I'm very unimportant. So, uh, the UW-Madison Intellectual History Group, the UW-Madison Department of History, the South Central Federation of Labor, which of course is... Our Wisconsin Revolution, do, are there people from that? Um, and, in case you missed it, the Madison Institute. Um, so, uh, let's see, I want to make a couple of announcements. First of all, the person who really deserves a lot of thanks, and I think he's hiding at the back of the room, is Matt Ryder, who did all the work. Um, in addition to that, I want to mention that this is going to be recorded by Alternative Radio, which is... Uh, an alternative media outlet that's run by David Barsamian, who will in fact be in town uh, in a couple of weeks. And since I'm been asked to introduce Nancy, I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity to mention to you that Tariq Ali will be here on the 19th. This is the Haven Center's Award for contri Lifetime Contribution to Critical Scholarship. Um, and David will do an onstage interview of him. In addition to that, I want to mention somebody whom you probably have not heard of, and this is not as easy to read from that distance. Uh, Alex Anievis, who's going to be talking about a set of um, topics which are not unrelated to, I think, what you're going to hear tonight, I mean, at least to some degree. Legacies of Fascism, Race in the Far Right, and the Making of the Cold War. And that's going to be on the UW campus, and I'll leave one of these around for you to uh, take more careful look at it, but the posters for Ali are over there. Uh, that's going to be next week, uh, Tuesday, October 10th, Wednesday, October 11th, uh, 4 p.m. lectures on campus, and then a, an open seminar, uh, the 12th, um, at 12.20. And Nancy has familiarity with that kind of format, because she was here 10 years ago as a Haven Center visiting scholar, um, and in fact, um, she as she was reminding me, the stuff that she talked about back then played a role, some of the precursors in, of the work that you know eventually led to this book that she's going to talk about, um, which, I'm losing my bio on her here, um, is available at the back. She's, she will sign copies afterward. Room One's Own has been gracious enough to come here tonight and sell copies of this. But who is Nancy, anyway? Um, she is the William H. Chaffee Professor of History and Public Policy at Duke University. Um, she is an award-winning scholar of the 20th century US. And this new book, Democracy in Chains, is already getting lots of attention. Um, it is, uh, it's been described by Publishers Weekly as a thoroughly researched and gripping narrative and a feat of American intellectual and political history. Booklist called it perhaps the best explanation to date of the roots of the political divide that threatens to irrevocably alter American government. <coughs> the book just yesterday? Yes. Yesterday was named a finalist for an, as a National Book Award. Even though she looks like she's only about 25 years old, she's been at this a while, and she's produced a whole bunch of books, um, and I, four others, and I'll mention a couple, um, even though, again, it's hard to read this. She's the author of um, Freedom is Not Enough, The Opening of the American Workplace, called by the Chicago Tribune, Contemporary History at Its Best, and Behind the Mask of Chivalry, The Making of the Second Ku Klux Klan, Plan named a New York Times noteworthy book a few years ago. Um, so I think that's probably enough for me to talk. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to you and give her a round of Thank you. 
Patrick for that fun introduction. And thank you all for coming out tonight uh, to be part of this conversation that we will uh, have before long. And I just want to say uh, the only thing that you neglected that's important to me in the bio is that, oh, sorry, the only thing that Patrick neglected in the bio that's important to me is that I came to Wisconsin to do my graduate work. So I am Patrick. And I was never prouder to have been from Wisconsin than in 2011, as I watched you all from North Carolina fighting the valiant fight at the, you know, as this thing that we'll be talking about tonight was rolling out. You were the first people in the eye of the storm, the first people to identify what a problem it was and to fight it vigorously. And uh, so, I was proud, and I'm really happy to be back here with you tonight to see so many old friends and some new friends in the audience, and also to be back in the Labor Temple. I came here for more than a few picnics over the years on, on Labor Day, and um, and really delighted to be here with you tonight. So, uh, on to the less less uh, encouraging part of my <laughs> remarks, which. Uh, I'll start with the obvious. American politics are in crisis, right? A government that is supposed to be of, by, and for the people is in crisis. Even elementary norms of civic decency and truth are in crisis. You know this. It has become abundantly clear of late to, uh, to anyone who might not have been paying close attention before. But what you might be struggling to figure out is how we got here and what that means. The watershed that we've reached in our public life now in 2017 has been fed by many streams, some of which have received extensive attention. Uh, those streams include the movement conservatism that made Barry Goldwater the Republican candidate for president in 1964, just after his vote against the Civil Rights Act of that year. Uh, another and related stream is the religious right. Then there is the white supremacist right, which has lately been trying uh, to rebrand itself. All of these are important and have produced the votes to affect radical policy change. But I'm here tonight to tell you about another piece of the puzzle of how we got into the dangerous situation in which we now find ourselves. A missing piece, I believe, and that is the ideas that are guiding the billionaire-backed radical right made notorious by Charles Koch. And I believe these ideas are the crucial piece that we have missed because they explain so much that otherwise seems mysterious. It's also crucial, I believe, because knowing about this piece may equip citizens such as all of us in this room to lead the way out of this mess before it is too late. Because I think there is an unmarked peril in our situation right now, and that is that the noisiest threats are getting the most attention. Among them, the chronic race baiting and bullying coming from the White House. But that spectacle, that daily, constant, nonstop spectacle, is drawing nearly all media and voter attention as an even more menacing plan to my understanding, is moving along a pace. It is moving along in the now 30 states wholly dominated by this cause to the point that the Democracy Alliance speaks of them as having an electoral stranglehold. Uh, it is moving along in federal agencies, and it is moving along in the courts. And this plan is being pursued by a much smaller cause but by an archly determined and a breathtakingly well-funded one. More than that, this causes architects aim to rewrite the rules of our society permanently. And more than that, this cause has shown before that they are willing to use these other more popular sections of the right, the religious right and the white supremacist right, to get what they want. I'll state my case simply. Behind all the seeming chaos and dysfunction in American public life right now, there is a strategy in play, a cold-eyed, calculated strategy. And that strategy is far along. One of its field generals said this to donors in late 2015. We're close to winning, he said. They, meaning the critics, 
the rest of us, don't have the real plan. The, they don't have the real plan, or sorry, the real path. Uh, that was Mark Holden, the head of Koch Industries Government and Public Affairs Operation, gloating to an invitation-only audience of billionaire and multimillionaire donors. Now, you've heard a lot uh, in the last several years, at least until the election of Donald Trump, uh, about the fortune that Charles Koch has been uh, uh, investing in changing our politics. But what you may likely not have heard about is the ideas uh, that technology, as Charles Koch refers to them, that have made those investments so devastatingly effective. And it's important to know that Koch had been funding libertarian intellectuals for three decades uh, before uh, he began to apply this technology in earnest uh, without effect. And now, uh, we can see that it has been devastatingly effective. And in the course of my research, I learned that it was an academic economist who taught Charles Koch that for capitalism, <laughs> the variety that they want to thrive, democracy must be enchained. So this book that I'm here to talk to you about, Democracy in Chains, uh, provides an unknown backstory of this defining moment uh, in history in which we find ourselves, as it also tries to uncover that real path to which Mark Holden referred. And it's, in its essence, the book is a story of two men, a thinker and a CEO, whose lives converged through a shared commitment to transform the model of government that our country built up over the course of the 20th century through citizen pressure uh, and organizing. The thinker was a Tennessee-born economist, James McGill Buchanan, who spent most of his career in Virginia institutions, beginning in Charlottesville. Uh, and the CEO is the Kansas-based, of course, Charles Koch, who spent most of his adult life, when he wasn't building Koch Industries into one of the largest privately held corporations in the world, spent most of his life trying to find a way to make our country and the world, in fact, confirm to his arch vision of economic liberty a kind of free reign capitalism akin to the 19th century variant that was skewered so brilliantly by Charles Dickens. That was also the kind of capitalism that brought us the Great Depression and the polarization between fascism and communism after World War I. So Koch's vision is an audacious one and a dangerous one. He is, to my mind, playing with fire uh, but it is the rest of us who will get burned. The story my book tells is first of the crucible in which Buchanan came up with this idea of enchaining democracy to insulate economic liberty, as the civil rights movement made headway in the Virginia where he was uh, working and in the nation as a whole in the late 1950s and 1960s. And then it is about how Koch funded an apparatus to make that idea a reality in a messianic quest that has produced the volatile situation we are now confronting. And I have to admit, up front, it's a frightening story. I've had a few people, maybe perhaps you've read it, um, I have had a few people, four, I think, so, uh, at this point, tell me that it, it's like a Stephen King novel. Uh, I've never read a Stephen King novel, but I kind of took the point that this is scary. Um, but I also believe that knowing what we're really up against is vital to assessing how best to defend a democracy that I think many of us now understand is facing existential threat. So I believe as a scholar and a citizen that knowledge can be empowering and I am happy, very gratified that that's what I'm hearing back from readers who are saying things like, I feel like the curtain has finally been pulled back or now you know, I see the, how the dots are connected, it makes more sense, now I know what to do, etc. So, so I'm hopeful that that will be a, a wider response rather than curling into a fetal crouch, which I sometimes <laughs> felt like doing when I was uh, engaged in this research. Uh, but rather than lecture uh, in a conventional way, I thought what I would uh, uh, do is uh, share with you the story of how I stumbled upon the trail that led me to these conclusions. Because I think that knowing the route that led to what I've just said will give you an even sharper sense of the stakes 
because it turns out that what we're seeing now, today, in 2017, is not the first time that the libertarian right has shown itself willing to exploit white supremacy to advance the cause of property supremacy. Also, the trail that led to these conclusions reveals the surprising role that some academics, some scholars, have played in bringing us to this point. Uh, and I think that's a history that all of us who work in higher education uh, need to reckon with. So what led me to uh, the fairly shocking uh, conclusions that I just uh, shared? In a word, serendipity. I am not a historian of economic thought. Um, I uh, am a historian of social movements uh, with a particular long-standing interest in the U.S. South. And about 10 years ago, I came across the tragic tale of Prince Edward County, Virginia, whose white officials answered the U.S. Supreme Court's uh, call to desegregate uh, its public schools without further delay by, as the white county officials put it, going out of the public school business entirely. They shuttered their entire public school system. They actually posted no trespassing signs on the public schools. They left black children with no formal education whatsoever, uh, only what social movement organizations could provide, as their white counterparts headed off to private segregation academies funded with state subsidized tuition grants with what we would today call school vouchers. And the county officials persisted in this course for five years until the courts compelled them to reinstate a public school system. So I was embarrassed that as a Southern historian, I had never come across this history. And I was deeply moved by what I found uh, in the archives of the American Friends mm -hmm. Service Committee. And so I started to research this story. And seeing that tax-funded school vouchers were crucial to the story interested me, because this has often been told as kind of the last gasp of Jim Crow, when in fact it was starting to look like maybe the first shout of neoliberalism. And lo and behold, I learned in short order that the University of Chicago ultra free market economist Milton Friedman had issued his first call for school vouchers in 1955 in the full knowledge of how they would be used in the South. Southern segregationist officials, particularly governors, had been threatening for uh, uh, several years as the Brown, the five cases that became Brown versus Board of Education wended their way to the Supreme Court, they had been threatening that they would shut down public schools rather than let black and white children uh, sit next to each other uh, under uh, compulsion by the federal government. And Friedman did this. And I know he did it in the full knowledge of what he was doing because I had the correspondence between him and an editor who pointed out how this manifesto would be used and also pointed out that black citizens could not vote in Virginia, had no say over these devastating, destructive public policies that were being adopted. But Friedman persisted in his course. So he became part of my story. But in following a footnote, I learned of a 1959 report, as this threat from Prince Edward County was in the air, because it was in the fall of 1959 that they were told to uh, finally desegregate. In 1959, two other economists who had set up a center for political economy and social philosophy at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville in 1956 issued this other report, and one of them was this man, James Buchanan. And this report attempted to refute a movement of moderate whites that had come together over the fall of 1958 to try to preserve the public schools from this massive resistance. And Buchanan and his colleague were essentially trying to uh, push back this moderate white uh, uh, movement by making a case that they didn't know how to do the math. And they were doing the math wrong because they were not realizing that if the state sold off all its facilities to private operators, those private operators would then have lower costs and they could provide better education, the economists argued, without the obeying the courts. Uh, and um, they also used a lot of the language that would be familiar to us now, that it would break up the monopoly 
of schools, that it would bring competition, that it would bring freedom of choice, give parents a vote on where their kids went, and so forth. Uh, and they did this in the full knowledge that the schools uh, that would be funded this way and supported by this fire sale of public goods would be white segregation academies because those were the only private schools in question. Now, needless to say, it stunned me as a university professor to see two university professors making a case for what their state's most arch segregationists were seeking. That was the most radical demand of a group called the Defenders of State Sovereignty and Individual Liberty, Virginia's equivalent of the White Citizens Councils of the Deep South. And they were seeking, in effect, this fire sale of, of public uh, resources to, to support their, their segregation academies. And it also intrigued me that these economists did not make their case in racist terms, as some at the time did, but instead in economic terms. And in fact, they were leveraging their authority as university professors and as economists, leveraging their discipline to back up the most right-wing anti-democratic figures of the day. So these two men, Buchanan and his colleague Warren Nutter, knew they were exploiting the school's crisis to move their libertarian agenda, an agenda for those of you who know the Mont Pelerin Society, they both were uh, uh, admitted to membership by then and were active uh, in that transnational uh, neoliberal group. Um, and they were saying that this was part of what they called the free society, right? This libertarian agenda, even though they showed no sympathy whatsoever for the black civil rights activists whose slogan was freedom now. And in fact, whose First Amendment rights had been taken away by the same state legislature in the massive resistance program with no protest from the libertarians at the University of Virginia. And the cover letter that Buchanan and Nutter sent to Virginia uh, elected officials, uh, including one who had promoted these anti-NAACP laws, said that they were issuing their report and, quote, letting the chips fall where they may. Letting the chips fall where they may. Uh, and I knew where those chips would fall. <laughs> Anyone who was paying attention to what had happened in Virginia over the preceding three years knew exactly where those chips would fall. They would fall especially hard on black children and their families. Uh, and it just, I don't know, it just sort of, that phrase just lodged itself in my gut somehow and kept me focused on this Buchanan and wanting to know more. Because I could see how whatever was in his mind, whatever he personally thought about uh, matters of race, he was acting in the full knowledge of the harm that these actions would inflict on children in Virginia's schools. And as an educator, I wondered how could anyone do such a thing? Not in mindless ignorance, but in cold-eyed calculation. So trying to solve that puzzle, though, led me to another one that was equally mystifying, because at the time I knew so little about libertarianism as an organized cause. It actually has been, for most of our history, utterly marginal, right? Because these ideas are not persuasive to that many outside the ranks. The new shocker, as I started to pursue this James Buchanan, came in another tantalizing brief reference from a distinguished comparative political scientist that actually Jane Collins here um, from UW turned me on to. And uh, Alfred Stapon, this political scientist, mentioned in passing that Buchanan's Virginia School of Political Economy had a more important and lasting effect on Chile under the Pinochet dictatorship than Milton Friedman. And Everybody of a certain age who was following politics will have heard that Milton Friedman went to uh, Chile, uh, which was under the most brutal, barbaric dictatorship that, be, that, that led, that it helped fuel the human rights consciousness of the 1970s. It was so bad. Friedman went in 1975 to advise on how to combat inflation. That was well publicized. What wasn't well publicized was Buchanan's visit five years later. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but at that point, I, when I 
uh, learned of this, I still didn't know quite what the Virginia School was or how it differed from the Chicago School of Economics, which most of the Virginia faculty had attended. Uh, so I began to try to get more information about this guy, Buchanan. And I learned that he had won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. We can talk more about the nature of those Nobel Prizes in the discussion if anybody wants to. Um, but uh, I learned that he had won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 1986, and that he was awarded the prize uh, by the Swedish Academy for having pioneered a new way of thinking that uh, was called public choice economics. Uh, and this public choice economics became influential in uh, not only economics, but particularly political science and law, and also among uh, activists and elected officials on the right. So what Buchanan did that was new was what he liked to call the economic analysis of politics. But his economic analysis of politics was very different from, say, another stream, like Marx's economic analysis of politics involved questions of class and power and whatnot. Buchanan's was very different. What he did was to apply Chicago-style individualist uh, uh, models to political actors and to argue that those political actors could only be understood as individuals seeking their own personal self-interest, not the common good, as they claimed. Um, and that led Buchanan to some, uh, some interesting uh, uh, puzzle solving that, that, that drew attention. For example, he came up with a new explanation of deficits that has proved very persuasive uh, to many elected officials, too. Um, Buchanan solved a puzzle that Keynesian economists had not, which is why governments would overspend, not just in times of uh, recession or depression, when you needed to get the economy going with government uh, investments, but also in times of prosperity. And Buchanan's explanation was that official self-interest in re-election led them to make profligate promises to multiple constituencies in the knowledge that the cost would be borne by others, not by themselves. Um, and uh, this was persuasive to, to many people and drew a lot of attention, and it's not completely wrong. Uh, okay, so that interest in containing public spending, uh, and he, his, his tra particular training was in public finance, so a great focus on uh, government ta on taxation, on government revenue streams, on government spending, and so forth. But that interest in containing and rolling back government spending led also to a new emphasis on the incentives of the political process and how tweaking those incentives uh, might yield very different outcomes. And I have to say here that those ideas have since interested people who are not on the right, most famously um, uh, Cass Sunstein, who worked on regulatory matters under uh, President Obama, um, and thought about creatively about how you could nudge incentives to improve public health, you know, doing things like, say, you know, moving uh, sugary cereal out of kids' reach in the carts down to the bottom you know, or the top without, it, it, that doesn't infringe on anybody's freedom, but it might, you know, uh, 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 improve public health. But, so there's a wider school of public choice economics, but Buchanan's Virginia School of Political Economy was always distinctive. And Buchanan himself said, looking back uh, in a documentary, that when he set to work in the late 1950s, the idea of the public interest was dominant in politics, right? Now we all know the public interest isn't a thing like this podium, right? It's, but it's something that we construct through conversation and deliberation. But if you have an idea for how we might all be better off and you have a constituency to promote that idea and you persuade people, we might just get something like Social Security or the Wagner Act or the Civil Rights Act or you know many other uh, things uh, as we persuade people of what the public interest was. But Buchanan said of this idea of the public interest, he said, that's what I wanted to tear down to tear down, that's his, that's his verb. And again, I thought, why would anyone want to do that, right? To tear down the idea of the public interest or the common good. Reading more, I learned that to a libertarian like Buchanan, there is no common good. Any such notion of shared purpose will lead government to coerce those who don't agree with the majority. 
and Buchanan and his colleagues came to argue that democracy violates the individual liberty of the minority. Now, the only minority I ever saw them express concern for was the wealthy minority. So that's who we're really talking about here, although he did not specify. Uh, but in the case of wealthy taxpayers who don't share the majority's view of the public interest, these men argued, it all but steals their property if it taxes them for purposes they don't share. And Buchanan, even in his academic writing, could be quite agitational about this. So in the book that he described as the uh, sort of the, the, the major work of his career that came out in 1975, he said at one point, what difference is there between a mugger in Central Park that takes my wallet and a government that takes my taxes for purposes I don't support? So it was quite uh, agitational, uh, buried in game theory and all these other, <laughs> other uh, frameworks. But basically, he was insisting that we are not our brother's keepers, right? Or at least we should not be using government to shift tax revenues from one citizen to another. And he also came to talk about all of this in very stark and foreboding terms. In fact, in a language that I think anyone could recognize as dehumanizing. <laughs> He spoke of net tax recipients, in other words, people who get more from government than they give in in the way of taxes, people that Mitt Romney would later refer to famously as the 47%. Uh, Buchanan spoke of people who were net tax recipients as, quote, parasites on the productive. He warned of predators and prey. Uh, the predators would be people going to government, particularly in groups, seeking things that they could not get themselves as individuals in the market. Uh, so he used this language of predators and prey in a vocabulary that made fellow citizens, say senior citizens seeking a drug benefit or uh, uh, public sector workers seeking higher wages or smaller class sizes or you know whatever, but all of those groups he began to depict as predators and depict the wealthy taxpayers as their prey. Uh, needless to say, this is a vocabulary that is disinhibiting. It is a vocabulary that licenses hostility and it is a vocabulary that is rife on the American right today, owing to decades of inculcation of these ideas. And as I read more, I learned too that for those who think this way, justice is a very simple matter. I keep what I earn, you keep what you learn. This is actually a direct quote from Buchanan's colleague Walter Williams. Uh, and then you collectively can only legitimately tax me if I agree with your goals and methods. So in this libertarian view, only if there is unanimity can a purpose truly be said to be fair or advancing the common good. That's quite something. <laughs> Very hard to have a sustainable society uh, with, with, with a, a system uh, of uh, uh, with the, the unanimity as, as your desideratum. But Buchanan did not stop there. Uh, believing this way, in the 1970s, he moved from scholarship to organizing, began calling for the creation of a counterintelligentsia well before many others did in uh, uh, 1970. Um, and he also began arguing to funders on the right uh, and to, uh, to uh, corporate allies and political allies that the right needed to create, again in his words, a gravy train in order to bring people into this cause, get them committed to these libertarian views, and get them to stay uh, in the movement. And he moved from analysis to prescription. He moved into what he called constitutional economics, uh, with the goal of coming up with a legal regime, a system of legal rules that could protect capitalism from government that could enshrine the rights of the wealthy minority to a degree no society anywhere had ever done. And he actually, on more than one occasion, said that by this measure, by uh, of protecting the rights of the wealthy minority from these predators, uh, all existing constitutions were failures. That's how radical this vision is. He didn't think any constitution anywhere in the world adequately protected this minority. And he found a very interested audience among the uh, generals in need of a new constitution in Chile in 1980. 
as the military junta of Augusto Pinochet uh, came <coughs> under pressure from the international community to uh, return to civilian rule at some point and to operate by law, by a constitution, not by brute force as it had been, um, they invited Buchanan to Chile to advise on how to do to advise on how to devise a constitution that could do this thing, that could protect capitalism from government. The dictatorship was willing to eventually cede power to a predominantly civilian government, but they wanted to make absolutely sure that the radical changes that they had effected when popular power was completely undermined, when you know, thousands of activists had been killed, trade unions were smashed, farmers' organizations weren't allowed to operate, student organizations weren't allowed to operate, there was no freedom of the press. Uh, they had done things like sharply privatized education, privatized health care. They went over to a system of individual retirement accounts for Social Security, which were invested with the financial system sector, which eventually lost people's savings uh, after charging them a fortune. In any event, they wanted to lock in all of these things that they had accomplished, and Buchanan advised them on a constitution that could help them to do that. And in 2013, move the, the you know, uh, uh, Clock forward, 2013, Michelle Bachelet, a president who was elected by two-thirds of the Chilean people after huge mobilizations in the streets, particularly by young people who were angry over the higher education system and particularly the unaffordability of college, uh, she came into office with this reform program and realized that what she called authoritarian trammels in this constitution were keeping her from delivering to that supermajority of the Chilean people. And she complained that this constitution of liberty, as Buchanan's allies called it, had put locks and bolts on what the government could do. On, how, on the people's ability to express their will through government. And here I think it's important to pause and say, we are not talking about checks and balances, okay? Check, you know, we're all for some kind of checks and balances. And you know, in, in the United States, we would not have had the Brown decision, but for those checks and balances to protect minority, uh, minority rights. Um, so checks and balances are important, but what we're seeing here is locks and bolts. And people, that kind of constitution is coming to America. Thanks to pressure from the Koch donor network, uh, led by Charles Koch and the organizations he funds, the radical rich are seeking to achieve the kind of binding constitutional change that Buchanan urged without informing the public of their true goals. And thanks to assiduous organizing by the apparatus that these arch-right donors fund, and a Republican Party that they have all but taken over with the threat of primary challenges. Again, another new verb in our public life to be primaried. We didn't used to have that, but that's how they keep elected officials uh, subservient to the donors rather than uh, um, uh, accountable to the voters. Um, and the promise of dark money if they obey the donors. This cause now has in place 27 of the 34 states needed to call a constitutional convention. 27 of 34. Now, just to be clear, we have not had a constitutional convention in America since 1787, when that document was crafted by people who went to Philadelphia and did something other than what they were charged with doing. So there are rules on how you choose delegates, how, you know, how the process is set up to create such a convention, but once you get to this convention, it's open season. The people there can do what they want and change the Constitution as they will, and the Koch network is coming in to such a convention with about 10 what they call liberty amendments already in mind that would radically change our government and that would essentially undermine the kind of government that citizen action since the 1890s uh, has asked for. And we are perhaps a few years away from this at the rate things are going. So it's really serious stuff. Now you might be wondering how I put together how Buchanan's ideas were guiding this stealth plan of the radical right, which Mark Holden called the real, uh, the real path. And the answer is, again, by coincidence, <laughs> I happened to move to North Carolina in 2010, right after President Obama won the 
four, uh, I mean, right after the, in 2008, Obama had won North Carolina by 14,000 votes. Um, some of which I helped to register, I confess. Um, uh, uh, by the time I got back to North Carolina in 2010, a radicalized Republican Party, dominated by the Tea Party, funded by the Koch brothers and their North Carolina ally, uh, Art Pope, had just won majorities in both houses of the state legislature. And suddenly, the things that I was reading in Buchanan's work that still seemed so abstract as I was trying to understand this Chilean uh, interlude became concrete and shocking as uh, North, the North Carolina General Assembly's lead donor, this man, Art Pope, his institution, Civitas, boasted of the big bang his grantees were delivering as they made this once moderate state that prided itself on being the state that had moved from the poorest of southern states to the best off through public investments, this once moderate state became a laboratory for this right-wing cause. And so what did I see happening in this uh, big bang in North Carolina that really felt like, as you felt like in, in Wisconsin, a kind of shock and awe, application of a shock and awe doctrine of warfare, right? Where you hit people on so many fronts that they just feel overwhelmed and paralyzed. Uh, so what I saw happening is that they, Buchanan had long urged his teammates to focus, if they wanted to see radical change, to focus not on who rules, doesn't matter the personalities, or even so much the parties, focus on the rules. And he explained to like thinkers and those who funded them, including Charles Koch, that if you wanted to get the kind of radical transformation that libertarians did, and that most people did not want, and they understood that, then you had to focus laser-like on systematically changing the rules of governance. And what I watched unfold in North Carolina, you had your own version here, was a stunning barrage of radical rules changes on this model, one after another. Extreme gerrymandering to misrepresent the will of the voters. New measures to undermine workers' rights to organize in unions, particularly public sector unions, but not only those unions. Attacks on public education at all levels and radical cuts in funding for it while siphoning off public resources to private uh, schools that were under no legal accountability to teach students anything. Uh, this is in the words of a judge. Uh, repeal of a hard-won racial justice act to ensure fairness in policing and in the uh, uh, legal system. Refusal to accept the Medicaid expansion of the Affordable Care Act despite a crying need for health care among people who made too much to get uh, Medicaid and too little to be able to afford to buy health care. Rolling back measures to protect the environment and reduce global warming. Throughout all of this, ending transparency and normal measures of governing like hearings. Uh, and then to cap it all off, what has come to be known as the Monster Voter Suppression Act that had some 15 different elements of ways of keeping away from the polls people who disagreed with this, including young people, including students. And what proved so disturbing to me, both as a scholar and a citizen, was that I could see that the new Republican majority was applying Buchanan's ideas to get what they otherwise could not. Also unsettling, though, was watching how all the critics of all this good, well-intentioned people who were shocked by the U-turn their beloved state was taking, how the critics were missing the deep operational strategy that unified all these far-flung measures. People genuinely could not see that the men pushing this agenda were not misinformed about the likely consequences of the agenda they were ramming through. They fully understood that it would inflict grievous harm on many of their fellow citizens. But they believed that their end game was worth that price. They were, you could say, in cold calculation, letting the chips fall where they may. And what my fellow critics of all this uh, did not see, not even the brilliant Reverend William Barber, who created an inspiring movement, which I also participated, called Moral Mondays to Fight It, what the critics did not see is that this agenda was backed by an ethical system that gave these actors confidence and let them feel heroic enough to weather the criticism and the opposition. 
you encountered a version of that here in Scott Walker, that sense of firm conviction that he was pursuing some higher dream. Now, this ethical system is foreign to most of us, and there's good reason for it, that, because it runs counter to all the world's leading religious traditions. But it is an ethical system, and it has its own stark, stark coherence that I believe we need to understand if we are going to deal with the crisis that Buchanan's ideas and Koch's money have created in America. To wit, the libertarian morality says that it would be better to have people die from lack of health care than to receive it from government, from taxes paid by others. And that really, ultimately, is what the architects of this cause mean when they talk about personal responsibility. They mean that you should be on your own. And if you fail to save for all of your future needs, you deserve your fate. Witnessing your suffering will also have educational value. It will teach others to save. Now, I have had six women in my life who have had breast cancer, including my own stepmother. And I know, and I think you know, if you know anyone who has had a serious illness in our society, that there is absolutely no way to save for catastrophic illness. Just like there is no way to save for a long period of unemployment. Just like there is no way to save on your own for your retirement. But according to this libertarian cause, that's really the dream society that each one of us, from the time we're sentient, should be having private savings accounts for all of those needs. Now, you could see now, this. Hayek thought there was supposed to be a safety net. Okay, but Hayek's gone, and other people are in charge now. I'm telling, I'm look, don't. Well, Buchanan, Buchanan's gone too. What would your book like be like if he was still alive? So why don't we hold all the right. question until I'm finished? But uh, he didn't explain the format at the beginning. Oh, well, usually you don't interrupt the speaker. That's just my experience. Uh, um, especially in Wisconsin, right, where people are known for politeness. But, uh, and uprising. Come on. <laughs> well, don't take it from me. Take it from the last uh, several months of the newspapers. Everyone was wondering why the Republicans in the Senate were rushing to push through these three horrific bills, one after another, that would have terrible consequences, that had no popularity anywhere. One of the ones that had the strongest chance to pass never polled more than, I believe it was 16%. Uh, they were not popular even with Republicans, and they had majority state in not one state in the Union. And yet, the entire Republican Senate delegation was pushing these measures through at breakneck pace without traditional Senate procedures. You could only do this if you have this libertarian morality that says what I just said, and also if you had this Coke donor network on your back making sure that you did that or you get out of office because they will primary you. Now, I learned all this and more in 2013 when James Buchanan died, and finally that September I got access to his private archive at George Mason University. And ironically, I arrived in Fairfax just as a government shutdown led by congressional Republicans who had been tutored in the ideas of this Virginia school was unfolding in Washington, D.C. Ted Cruz was the loudest among them, but there were many, uh, and uh, unfolding in Washington at such cost to so many. And it, that was an application of the kind of coercive bargaining that Buchanan taught the right and his corporate allies. And in Buchanan's records, I found my developing understanding confirmed in a way that sometimes literally took my breath away. To give you just one example, in his private office, I found stacked helter-skelter on a chair, a pile of documents that exposed how Charles Koch and his operatives from uh, some of his organizations and the George Mason University economics faculty, its leaders, cooperated uh, to establish a base camp for this political project right across the Potomac from Washington, D.C. in a public university. And once I brought home all the hundreds of documents I had copied uh, in Buchanan's archives and put them together with his writings and other sources, I found myself laying down pieces of a puzzle that sometimes literally nauseated me in its sheer scope and audacity because it now encompasses 
literally uh, it, dozens of ostensibly separate national organizations, some of whose names will be familiar to you, the Cato Institute, the Heritage Foundation, ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, and there are many more. Uh, but if you include the state level operations that make up the state policy network, uh, exposed so well by Lisa Graves from the Center for Media and, and Democracy here in Madison, you have three such affiliates here in Wisconsin. If you include those in the international affiliates of the Atlas Network, which operates in 90 countries now, we are talking about hundreds of organizations working to radically alter government and society funded by wealthy donors hostile to this 20th century model of government who are determined to bring this free reign capitalism into being without being honest with the people about what they are doing. And as I took the measure of this project, I saw something else as a historian. The form of government that these men see as ideal, as liberty, mirrors that of mid-century Virginia in all but the state-forced racial segregation. When James Buchanan set to work in Charlottesville in 1956 at the peak of massive resistance to Brown versus Board of Education, pledging to state leaders that he would set up the center to preserve liberty, that state had just been identified by the political scientist V.O. Key as the most oligarchical state in the South and therefore in the nation. And uh, this distinguished political scientist wrote, Next to Virginia, Mississippi is a hotbed of democracy. That's how oligarchical Virginia was. And so here we come full circle to the civil rights era history with which I started. Because you have to ask yourself, what is the substance of James Buchanan's and Charles Cope's idea of liberty, but mid-century Virginia, the state subjected to what V.O. Key called the most thorough control by an oligarchy, with tools that would now be grafted onto the nation as a whole. Of course, the state-mandated racial oppression would go. This cause would not advocate for that. But nearly everything else about the political economy of mid-century Virginia enacts their dream, to wit, the uncontested sway of the wealthiest citizens, the use of right-to-work laws and other ploys to keep working people powerless, the ability to fire dissenting public employees at will targeting educators in particular, voting rights restrictions to keep those unlikely to agree with the elite from the polls, the deployment of states' rights arguments to deter the federal government from promoting equal treatment, the suspicion of public education as a source of subversion, the regressive tax system and refusal to make forward-looking public investments, the opposition to Social Security and Medicare, and the parsimonious response to public needs of all kinds, from decent schools to public health and more. And the question that this stealth plan presents Americans with, once we know it, is at one level quite simple. Do we want to live in a cosmetically updated version of mid-century Virginia? A place that crushed democracy, prevented collective organizing, and suppressed human dignity to allow its elites free <coughs> reign? A state that was determined, determined to prevent the kind of government that citizen action had demanded at least since the populist movement of the 1890s. A government that can stand up to corporations that ride roughshod over the people, that can protect workers' rights and public health, that can provide economic security to the aged, that can take action against discrimination, and that can ensure our air and water quality and the fate of our planet. All of this and more is at risk right now. And we have to ask ourselves, is what this cause seeks the kind of country that we want to live in and bequeath to our children and future generations? That is the real public choice. And if we delay our response much longer, those who are imposing their stark utopia will choose for us. Thank you. Right to repeat the questions. Okay. Yes. In the back. Yes, I'm wondering about the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. as uh, Ralph Nader and others call, call it, and 
the preservation of that wealth against those uh, people who would, would want to privatize anything. And I'm just wondering how that melds into, in, into the mm -hmm. history, that, and the timeline that you're projecting. Mm -hmm. When did these notions of privatization take fire? And were the characters that you were mentioning uh, the architects of, uh, of those notions, or were there some other people uh, who would want to erode the commonwealth, those things that we all have, including air, water, right. uh, et cetera, dot, dot, dot. Thank yes, you. yeah. So uh, the uh, broader cause with Repeat which... the question. Oh, sorry. The, the question was, what about the commonwealth, right? What about the commons, the things that we have built up together that we rely on, uh, you know, like clean air and water and things like public higher education and all those good things we've built up over the years. And the answer to that is that uh, this broader um, uh, cause has, has come up with this argument of the tragedy of the commons, right? To say that allegedly, if you hold things in common, there won't be an incentive to maintain them, and therefore we would just be better off privatizing um, so that the owners will presumably take good care of things. Uh, I don't think that is exactly how things will work at all, having observed, for example, the private school providers in my own state and the way that they are bilking the public to provide substandard education. Uh, it, 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 in every domain you can think of, there are investors who are hungry for these public monies. For example, in um, uh, uh, Wall Street, you know, among the hedge fund people, you know, there are people who are literally salivating at the notion that there's something like $800 billion worth of government money going into education that they think, if you could put it into the private sector, imagine the profits you would make by teaching children by computers with no human beings, right? Um, so, uh, so I don't buy their account, but that is their account, and I will say, in my book, I was focused on this threat to democracy, on this notion of, you know, uh, enchaining uh, the Leviathan, as Buchanan referred to it. Uh, but there is so much going on that this cause is involved with, including threats to the Western lands. They're very angry at the fact that the government owns a lot of land in the West. They would like to see that privatized. They would like to cut into the national park system. So there's a lot to pay attention to right now if we care about the commons. Yes, sir. Buchanan's early writings, did, did Buchanan's early writings or the other writing, <laughs> writings of these economists, did they address the question of why the pre-tax distribution of earnings was in fact just and should not be uh, confiscated? <laughs> you know, did, the, so the question is, did, did they, they address they, why the pre-tax uh, um, uh, distribution of earnings was, in their view, just and shouldn't be uh, interfered with? And Buchanan, uh, according to his students and his colleagues, would often use this phrase, we start from here. And he would use that in two ways. One of them was to say, essentially, we have a given distribution of wealth, right? And we're not going to go back and revisit that. You know, and for a white Southerner to be saying that, coming out of a society where, in, in his own institution in Virginia, there were great historians like Paul uh, Gaston who were, you know, uh, demonstrating uh, um, uh, how much you know uh, had been taken right from African Americans and poor whites in this oligarchical system but again he would say we start from here and he also used that phrase we start from here to think about how to get to this great libertarian beyond so he didn't want you know kind of pie in the sky thinking but instead practical measures for how to get from here to there so uh, again I think one more thing I would say about that too is that you know his way of thinking and the kind of Austrian economics that he's connected to just seems to refuse to acknowledge the existence of classes. They're so focused, the classes. They don't acknowledge classes and therefore class power. It's all about individuals and how well they contract as individuals to, to uh, fulfill their needs. So to me as a historian, it's, it's frankly an absurd way of thinking, but it has proven very influential. Uh, let me take some more from other parts of the room. Yes, I'll come back. So I guess I'm curious if in your um, reading about the canon, you also saw any overlap with Ayn Rand's thinking? Mm -hmm. Because I, I think with Free Enterprise, yes. and the notion of that. And then the second question is, in understanding this kind of path to this oligarchical society, in my understanding, libertarianism is actually most like anarchy, mm -hmm. anarchy 
where there's mm -hmm. no government, no government to step. Mm -hmm. So is this a step, do you, are you envisioning that this path is a step mm -hmm. toward our, all of our people, right. or just toward revisions of like no government, less government, or government than all of <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I never saw Buchanan himself showing interest in Ayn Rand. It's possible that it was there and I didn't come across it, but I don't think he was a particular fan of hers. But the students who would come into his programs, particularly the one at Charlottesville, which was set up in the early 60s, um, you know, fellow students would say that they, they all were sporting their Ayn Rand dollar sign uh, tie, tie pins, because those were the days, right, when, you know, it was only men at the University of Virginia until 1970, and it was the days when men would wear at least ties, if not coats, and many of them had those Ayn Rand uh, tie pins. So absolutely, Ayn Rand is an important pathway into this libertarian cause, and probably the most common pathway, particularly for young men who seem particularly attracted to these ideas, women not so much. Women have a sense of the consequences, I think, of, of this kind of thought, and who would actually pick up the slack. Um, but, uh, so Ayn Rand was, uh, no, it's true, and actually they've complained. They've complained. One of them said that um, uh, men think like natural economists. You know, women just don't seem to get it. Um, the Mont Pelerin Society, their 50th anniversary, uh, they were talking about problems that remain for whatever, free free enterprise or whatever, however they phrased it. And they identified all of these uh, problems that I actually talk about in the book. But they said, uh, and, and feminism was a problem, and they said women are socialistic for no apparent reason. <laughs> right? This is men who have taken women's labor for granted from the time they were this high, and they can't imagine that women might have reasons for things like wanting public you know, quality child care or elder care or welfare policies to protect the people and provide a safety net, etc. Yeah. I guess the, the second part was question about kind of this path toward the oligarchy. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So there were some people who would talk about what they called anarcho-capitalism, and this guy Murray Rothbard, who was a very pro prolific um, uh, libertarian funded by Koch uh, in the 1970s, was like that. But I think Koch pretty quickly got tired of them. That they, well, Buchanan always said, he would talk about government as slavery. And he would say that it's better, I think he said it'd be better to be 30% uh, slavery than 70%, or you know, like that kind of language, right? So he would accept that there could be some legitimate role for government. And all the libertarians, as far as I know, at least most of them, would say that government has three functions. To protect property, right, well, maybe four. Uh, to uh, to uh, provide for the national defense, to uh, um, enforce the rule of law, including protecting property rights, and to guarantee social order. Beyond that, they should not go. They have no right to go. Um, so uh, I don't think that it would ever be anarcho-capitalism. Well, there are, I will say, there are people in this cause who talk about things like privately funded police forces and all kinds of other nutty stuff, but I don't think that's what the people we're talking about are doing. And in fact, they are quite willing to use the state in a very heavy-handed manner against local communities. So, um, you know, the phenomenon called preemption, which again, Center for Media and Democracy has been great in drawing attention to that. That is a version of what they were doing in mid-century Virginia by telling, having the governor shut down schools in local communities that were going to comply with the courts. That was preemption. Now we have preemption telling us we can't raise local minimum wages or, you know, uh, enact anti-discrimination ordinances, etc. Yes? Is there any place modern contemporary that has actually implemented this whole funding exercise? Uh, no, but I would say Chile, if you look at that constitution in Chile, it does put on those locks and bolts on what the people can do. So uh, uh, the Chilean constitution uh, was important. And various uh, countries have tried parts of this. So New Zealand had this kind of um, neoliberal burst for a while um, and then said, you know, and, and reversed it. But Buchanan's center hired this guy, Morris McTeague, who was part of that and brought him to George Mason. And he's still telling people how to privatize. Um, the uh, Jose Pinera, 
who directed the Social Security privatization as Minister of Labor in Chile in uh, the 1980s, was hired at uh, the Cato Institute to promote Social Security privatization here in the U.S. and internationally. So I would say, you know, there's various places where they've made more or less advance, um, but no place where they've gone whole hog. There was also recently an article by uh, the journalist who's been following the coax, Lee Fang, talking about how uh, this Atlas network is making significant headway in Latin America. Um, but again, you know, no, uh, but frankly, also, I mean, some people have pointed out, like, these people want you to uh, buy into a notion of society that exists nowhere in the world, right? <laughs> nowhere. Um, and radically change all your institutions to enable it. So um, it's some caution might be in order on that, right? I mean, at this point, it is quite a rigid dogma. Um, and, and we, well, I don't want to talk too much. I'll take more questions. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to go back and forth from both sides of the room. Yes. Um, you mentioned in the beginning that the libertarian right is exploiting white, this white mm -hmm. supremacy movement and the Christian right. Mm -hmm. But you also share in the book something that I think is really important in terms of how they're mm -hmm. trying to um, influence public opinion mm -hmm. in terms of their involvement in yeah. economics departments and law departments yes. and universities. Can you say something more about that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, so um, the question was, uh, you know, you, you pointed out how they are willing to use white supremacy and um, the kinds of, of uh, prejudices of the religious right to gain power. Um, but what about the way that they are changing, trying to change the way we think through installing these bases in universities? And that is a really key part of the strategy. And the um, George Mason University, which I talk about at length in the book, is the flagship case of that kind of um, uh, collaboration. And you can see those George Mason people essentially providing defense, well, providing strategic help and technical assistance for this operation, uh, supplying a pipeline of talent. And that's what they're doing on campuses, is trying to identify, recruit, and fund students that they can bring into the apparatus. Um, but also, they run uh, defense for things that their people are doing out in the world. And it makes a really big difference if you can say, you know, so-and-so, the distinguished professor of acts, you know, is supporting Neil Gorsuch as he campaigns with uh, Mitch McConnell, for example, as one of the Scalia School of Law professors uh, recently did. Um, so the, the, the campus spaces are, are really important in a lot of ways. And I think uh, I understand that you at Madison now have the dubious distinction of three separate Coke funded centers. Um, and we are lucky enough here tonight to have a member of Uncoke My Campus, who's a new <laughs> Madison resident, Kylie <laughs> here. Um, so Kylie, do you want to say something? Maybe just tell people a little bit about Uncoke and why you guys think these issues are important and, and share that? Sure. Um, hello, my name's Kylie. Um, I work for an organization called Uncoke My Campus. Um, we work with students and faculty all over the country to help constituencies to break down the influence that Coke and other billionaire donors have on these campuses. They make these multi million dollar donations with strings attached around research and hiring to legitimize their political operations. Um, so we are a scrappy grassroots movement um, really working to fight that influence on campus at all the different levels, whether you're a faculty student, parents of a student, or just a taxpayer for a public institution, um, then you definitely have a stake in the machine. Um, I'm a flyer, if you want to come find me after, um, I'd love to talk more about it. Great, thank you. Thank you. And if you go on the website of Uncoke My Campus, these, these this is like the best for the educators here, the best students you've had. Like your dream students, they are such serious researchers and such skilled thinkers and organizers. And on their website, they have reports on different centers that the Cokes have set up, most notoriously Florida State University. Kylie, kind of it was at Florida State, right, where the Cokes were vetting faculty appointments and students' research topics. Yeah, yeah. So they've got, become a little bit more slick since then, since they found out that didn't play well. But um, but they're, they're still doing a lot of that. So here, and I'll get here and over there. Yeah. Yeah, so thanks for that wonderful talk. Um, one of the things you said to you know, set the stage for the presentation is that you expressed the hopefulness that getting the story that you're giving us 
might give us a certain kind of enlightenment to help us go out and try to put a stop to what's going on. Um, in addition to, uh, I want you to sort of say something about what the basis of your hopefulness is. We know that um, racism, ethnocentrism, mm -hmm. and the ethic of personal responsibility mm -hmm. have been really reliable tools mm -hmm. that have been used to, for example, prevent coalition building, um, which is you know, certainly needed to, to, to mount uh, an assault on what's going on. And you just think back what, for example, Martin Luther King was struggling with, mm -hmm. um, you know, after the Civil Rights Movement, toward the end of his life, before he got assassinated, he was spending time trying to get labor mm -hmm. to see common cause with the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. Right, all of you go and talk to labor unions and say, look, mm -hmm. let's, let's try to get over the race thing so that we can right. see that we need to come together. And if, I mean, just look around the room, I mean, it's, it's, you know, in what sense have we really made a lot of progress with, mm -hmm. with that? So what, what's the basis of your hope for this? Um, well, uh, I grant you that it's a challenging scene out there, um, but I, uh, I think I mentioned early on that I teach the history of social movements um, and that I've studied social movements, you know, going back to the revolution and the abolition movement. And there were people in the early 19th century who said, what are you talking about abolishing slavery? Slavery goes back to the Bible. We'll always have slavery. You know, this is inevitable. Don't even try to change it. You know, so I'm not saying, I mean, there's so much to do and such a heavy lift to get this society toward a kind of, you know, ethics of fairness and, and universal human dignity and sustainability and all these kinds of things that I think many of us value. It's not an easy lift, but the thing that will absolutely do it is the notion that it can't be done. <laughs> so, um, you know, I just know that all of the major social movements that I've ever looked at, there were people who said, you could not do this. You could never end slavery. You know, you could never, um, uh, you know, get, you know uh, get slavery out of the Constitution. You could never uh, enfranchise women. You know, workers would never get rights from the federal government. So, so I think it's not easy, but um, uh, Gramsci, the Italian thinker, said that it, it, it helps to have pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. So I think you're giving us <laughs> the pessimism of the intellect. I've also given you some of that. But you know, unless we're going to accept it and be trampled, right, and have people like this. I mean, look what happened to Flint, Michigan, and its water supply. That can be traced back to the Coke affiliate of the State Policy Network, the Mackinac Center, who said that when local communities uh, um, get into uh, red ink and aren't running their budgets well, they should be, the government, the state should appoint uh, unelected managers accountable to no one, an undemocratic system to run their affairs. Now, at this point, something like 50% of the African population, of African American population of Michigan is under those anti-democratic emergency managers where there's no local accountability. And that's how Flint got that crappy water because the emergency manager thought it would be cheaper to get the water from the polluted source. Uh, and look what happened to people. So, I mean, that's, you know, look what happened to people in these recent uh, hurricanes. I mean, obviously hurricanes are going to happen, but all the climate scientists who understand this stuff are saying that climate, the global warming and it, um, uh, climate change is making them worse, is inflicting more damage. Well, the Koch's fund climate science misinformation and denial and attacks on climate scientists. So, I mean, I don't know. I just, it, it's all of it, I think, is temperament. Like, I always grew up to not like bullies, right? You know, whenever I see a bully, I just want to get in the bully's face, you know? Because it's just, it's, it's, it's instinctual. And I think it is for a lot of us. And I think we are right now confronted with the wealthiest, most sophisticated bullies that we've seen since perhaps the antebellum era, when we had another set of anti-democratic bullies. And so I just think, we can either close our eyes and turn away from it thinking that we, we can't do anything about it or we can engage it. And again, I keep going back to the fact that this cause is doing what it's doing because it knows it is a permanent minority cause. They will never get majority support if they tell the truth about what they're really seeking. That to me is a challenge. There is a latent majority out there that we need to inform, to patiently inform, to reach out to and to activate because it's our only hope, I think. Yes, sir. If 
Did Ken ever, from his appearance, ever address the socialization of the costs associated with capitalism, the fact that the environment, pollution, mm -hmm. all those things are passed on, the rest of us pick up? We are never incorporated as part of their cost of doing business? Um, I don't remember Buchanan talking about that. Some of them do. They talk about, they call it externalities. They have all these, these kind of clunky, oh, the question was about whether Buchanan and his team ever talked about the social costs of business that get imposed on, imposed on the rest of us. Things like, you know, if they pollute your water supply, what happens then? Um, I, a lot of economists talk about that. I did not see Buchanan talking about that in the stuff uh, that I've looked at. But here's a real kicker, too. I'm surprised. Um, yeah, he, he might have. Again, I was, I was kind of following this thread of trying to understand this project of enchaining democracy, so I wasn't writing a biography of this man, and I wasn't trying to convey, you know, the whole broad school of thought that he was part of. I was focused on that thread, so, uh, so it's possible, but I didn't see it. But I know he did believe in this stuff about the tragedy of the commons, right, that, that um, leaving things, you know, widely held would result in their their uh, degradation. Um, so, uh, yeah, there was a hand back here and then some more up here. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, sort of three things. I, I think a lot of this goes back to the 70s. Mm -hmm. The backlash to Vietnam being a big part of it. Right? Yeah. You talked about the military part. Mm -hmm. That's a huge part. Number one, the nuclear weapons contractor General Electric got their spokesperson elected president in 1980, mm -hmm. and that started a lot of things downhill. But two other personalities, Lewis Powell, mm -hmm. the Powell Memo, uh, the, 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 who, who killed the American dream, according to uh, Hedrick Smith, he cites that as, as a key key moment in this thing, and, and all the uh, all, all the all the agencies. I mean, the, the mm -hmm. heritage, the Cato, mm -hmm. the uh, whatever set up in the 70s, you know, all a lot of them got set up right in that period. Yeah. Uh, and Leo Strauss, the philosopher, if you know him, was uh, exactly, he believed that elites should lead and that they should lie any way they can to get us to follow their lead. Uh, but elites should make the decisions for us. Uh, that's the Leo Strauss philosophy that was also part of the 70s of uh, right-wing movement. And, and uh, I don't know if you know much about him. Yeah. That, yeah, good. I'd like to hear more because uh, I haven't heard enough about him except they heard him one lecture once. Uh, and so those, those Leo mm -hmm. Powell and, and, and Ronald Reagan, boy, he's, he's said yeah. almost everything that's led to a disaster ever since. Thank you. Um, well, you won't be surprised to find to learn that General Electric supplied funding for Buchanan centers too, uh, as did many of the other corporations who were part of this broader business right. Many of them fossil fuel corporations who seem to just have this tendency to end up on the right. So Shell Oil, Sun Oil, um, I can't remember all the other oils, but they're, they're in his papers. Um, and the second question about the uh, uh, Powell memo, which is something that Lewis Powell, uh, who later Nixon uh, soon after that named to the Supreme Court, he was a Richmond attorney, and he wrote this memo for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce urging business to mobilize politically and to get more involved in uh, changing higher education, in the schools, in countering people like Ralph Nader and the consumer movement, uh, the courts, etc. Um, actually, in my book, though, um, I point out that Lewis Powell was commissioned to do this by um, uh, uh, a man whose name, I think it's late and I've been talking to many people today whose name is escaping me at this moment, um, but who had set up something in the massive resistance era called the Virginia Commission on Constitutional Government, uh, so was already pushing in the late 1950s these ideas of basically rolling back the New Deal, saying that you know, the Commerce Clause was being misused, government didn't have a right to be in all these things. Uh, so, so Powell's memo doesn't come out of nowhere, it comes out of a history that 
that is partly this kind of history talked about here. And then on the other question, I mean, there are many, many streams to the right, and I was trying to get at that in some of the setup to this. So I don't mean to say, like, this is the only thing, or this explains everything, but rather some of those other uh, segments of the right have had a lot of attention from scholars, including Strauss. I didn't see a connection between um, Strauss and Buchanan or his operations uh, in his Buchanan's papers. It's much more this broader Ma Pellerine Society, which Charles Koch joined in 1970 and quickly began using to recruit for his operations. Um, but, uh, uh, but no, I mean I know who he is, and I know that he's significant to some people. But he wasn't part of my story. Did you have you had your hand up or there? Yeah. Uh, that's fine. I have a question about the sort of intellectual apparatus used to justify school vouchers. Yes. Because on a certain level, school vouchers are still money, tax money taken from exactly to fund other people's children. So, what's the? How is it framed that this is superior to right. providing public education? Yeah, so the question was, uh, it began with a comment that, that um, uh, school vouchers are still funded with tax revenues, so how could you be saying that they would, these schools that they're creating with those vouchers or supporting would be superior to public uh, education? Well, Milton Friedman had an answer to that. He kind of dropped out of my story, uh, you know, which changed over time, but I still want to write up something about this. Milton Friedman was very clear and open with people in his papers. He basically think the, thought the government eventually should not be paying anything for education. He said that parents should be paying for their education of their children in the same way they pay for their food and clothing, except for a few charity cases. I mean, over and over again in his papers, I was sitting in the library going, <gasps> <laughs> and then all these people, all like the Cato Institute and Heritage and all these people that he was in conversation with about this, they would be saying, yes, 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 of course we agree on the, the ultimate goals, but we want to do this thing in between. Um, but anyway, so, um, so go figure. But, uh, but the, the case that they were making was this um, uh, case, this, you know, um, free market fundamentalist case that the market is necessarily better, that competition always improves things. They would claim that government had a monopoly, which it doesn't have a monopoly. There are private, there were private schools that weren't publicly uh, supported, but that the government has the mono a monopoly and breaking up that monopoly with competition will somehow improve it. I think we've had enough empirical uh, demonstration of the results from those experiments now to say that isn't true, um, but we had a period demonstration that much of this isn't true, but there's so much power behind it that it moves forward. Had you had your yeah. hand up too? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So I had a comment, which is a response to the um, question about why are you so optimistic in the, the person in the front row. Um, <laughs> and, and, I'm not optimistic. <laughs> I just have hope. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then I had a question for you. So, so the first comment is this. I think... Um, I really appreciate that you've done all this research and that you've brought all of this to light. Um, but I do think there's one piece of the puzzle which is important to put out there too, which is that there has been a failure on the progressive left mm -hmm. to construct an alternative yes. narrative mm -hmm. to build centers of education that are interracial, that bridge class divides, that in fact is convincing that like there's something that I, I hear you that this is a minoritarian group working intelligently but I think it's also the case that some of their ideas have become yes. compelling right. to considerable as sectors sense. of the population yeah. um, that are still living in some sort of Cold War bubble where you know these ideas gain traction because the other side is presented as kind of socialist, collectivist, totalitarianism, yeah, something like yeah. that. And I think the progressive left has a lot of work to do to um, suggest that we too have moved beyond Cold War frameworks mm -hmm. and we have intelligent defenses for the things that we believe in, that you know, yes. unions right. really do help workers, yes. Yes. that public education uh -huh. really will raise all boats, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so I, the, the basic idea, that the, the basic answer, I think, to the puzzle of what can we do is actually, in some sort of grotesque sense, tip our hats to these people who have developed a strategy which we should, in fact, be copying. 
because <laughs> it's about education uh -huh. and it's about seizing political yeah. power. And I think without those two pieces, we're uh -huh. not going to get anywhere. And it's about constructing yeah. a narrative that's compelling. My question for you is this. It's something that you talk about in um, the introduction of your book, and that's how far I got so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for getting that so I wanted to hear your, your answer. Um, someone was going to ask it. Donald Trump. Oh, a candidate. Oh, I hear I hear cries of enthusiasm. Um, a candidate who ran on a pretty strange platform by Coke standards, mm -hmm. right? Yes. He's this incredibly wealthy mm -hmm. person who's kind of in, an extreme caricature of capitalism, but at the same time, mm -hmm. he promised to defend all kinds of public services, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. I'm just How curious to hear yeah. your read on right. what you see as um, what's been happening since he's been power, whether yeah. he's been coped or, or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Um, so on your first point, I think you stated it really eloquently, and I think, yes, that is a challenge, that it has been a long time now that those that we broadly call the left have been kind of visionless, right? Um, and and I think Naomi Klein, you know, put her finger on it with saying no is not enough, right? That you have to have a vision of what is the good, fair, just society to inspire people to do the work that is going to be hard and is not going to be rewarding all the time and is going to have challenges. So I could not agree with that more. Um, one thing I do think, though, is that, you know, the crises are also opportunities, and the American left has been for a long time, and many many of us have felt it, and people try to get over it, but we've been kind of in silos, right? You know, and so at least a lot of people thought you could do like your civil rights, you know, anti-racist work here, separate from the unions over here, who thought they didn't need to talk to you, and then there were the women's movement people here, and the environmentalists there, and senior citizens were over here somewhere, and we we're all kind of in different conversations, and so the. The thing about this challenge that's coming from the Coke funded right is that they are coming for all of us. All of us. Every citizen who looks to government to use tax revenues to achieve ends that the wealthiest among us might not agree to. That means senior citizens whose drug costs are exorbitant and who need help. It means black citizens who are subject to all kinds of mistreatment, you know, by the police and the courts, let alone the schools and employers. You, know, you, you know what I'm saying. So I think our challenge at this moment, I think people have been grappling toward these connections for some time now with like the environmental justice movement and other things, but our challenge is to find to first of all build the relationships <laughs> that would enable us to find a common language um, and then to find that common language. But I take inspiration from uh, Bernice jo Johnson Reagan in this, the black feminist who said way back in the 80s, but it's still true, about coalition building, that if you're not feeling the strain, you're not doing the work, <laughs> right? That you need to be somewhat uncomfortable because we all have to start getting in conversations with people who don't agree with us to get where we collectively need to go. So there's a lot of work to be done. I wholly agree with you that we need a new vision on Trump. I would just say, um, I think it will be interesting to see archival and journalistic research come out about this as we figure out more about how he got where he is. But what I can say is now that he's there, he is totally, I think your phrase was, coked up, right? And so one veteran Coke researcher pointed out that 70% of his senior appointees are veterans of this Coke network. Um, I won't you know, bore you with the whole list, but it's really quite significant. And if you look at what's going through at the agency level, Department of Education, Justice, um, in, by, you know, in EPA, all these places, this Coke agenda is moving through as we are all focusing on the con man, right? He's tweeting, nee, 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 and we're all transfixed, right? And our media is transfixed. And so they think the Coke story was the story of 2015 and before, and now it's Donald Trump all the time. So uh, something that I'm encouraging people to do is the, a timeout Trump, right? Like take j even just a week as an experiment. Listen to none of his tweets, ignore everything that he says, everything that's written about him, and instead focus on what's happening to your state, what's going through in these agencies, what's going on in the courts, and then think about what you might want to do with it. Because I think we're engaged in a giant politics of distraction, that this agenda is being pushed through while he you know, puts mm -hmm. on a show. Uh, yes, you had your hand up. Um, I 
How would you say what the what you're trying to bring up the general statement of uh, uh, quotation marks, the science of economics? Mm -hmm. um, to this? I, mean, I get the sense that it's you know, we're almost talking about like, it's a corrupted system. You, you, yeah. you have other sciences, like climate science, you'll have but they'll have some people uh -huh. who are paid off and do things, but but generally the science in general is not mm -hmm. going to change. The cancer researchers, you would always have someone to say um, uh, who would be paid to say that the smoking was okay, but the science itself never followed. Mm -hmm. But in economics, you're, you're essentially seeing. I mean, I call it capitulation. It's like right. the acceptance and, and actual dominance. Mm -hmm. I, but my daughter is in high school. She's taking economics. Her textbook, it's, it's a standard textbook for mm -hmm. high school students now, is you see a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Maybe not 100%, but it's pretty much a thousandth line. Um, and you know, I, I come to the action you'll see to uh, any argument is you don't understand economics 101. Yeah. And you see that. And, yeah. and then me basically, then they'll yeah. come back with yep. this, this one. Yep. So where do you see, where do you see that? Science, that field. Yeah, um, well, again, I'm not an economist. I know some very nice and good and <laughs> responsible economists. I think we've got some people like Paul Kirkman, who's out there, you know, daily, you know, trying to, um, to help people understand uh, things. But as a discipline, I think economics seems to have been much more corruptible than other disciplines that I can think of. And there was actually recently an article about, yeah, just all the undisclosed monies that economists, you know, some, not all, but some economists are taking and how universities don't um, uh, um, kind of make them declare their conflicts of interest adequately. I think the best uh, exposition of this, and I think I probably have to end here because I'm getting signs that we're supposed to wrap up and, and um, we can talk informally uh, after, but um, the best uh, uh, illustration of this is the documentary Inside Job. If you've not seen that on the financial crisis, I really urge you to do it. I think the moral heat of that documentary concerns the economists who were providing the crappy advice that led to financial de deregulation, that caused these crises, uh, and that continue to do research on contract for huge sums of money without being clear with their students or their uh, administrations or the public that they are actually advancing the interests of the corporations who are contracting with them. So that, I think, is an illustration of this larger problem of these big agglomerations of uh, private money that are skewing uh, not only our democratic institutions but also our educational institutions um, and since so many of us are here in Madison with a strong tradition of the Wisconsin idea that I gather Scott Walker wanted to get rid of. Um, uh, but uh, with that, you know, those strong traditions of defending the public sector, I think, you know, this is a great place to restore academic integrity and restore integrity to our institutions. So um, I am not, I would not say that I am super optimistic, but I am hopeful. Um, and again, as a historian, I have to say, I've just been told we have to cut off the, the formal part now. But as a historian and somebody who looks at social movements, I mean, the impossible, what people are told is the impossible in one generation can quickly become the new norm if another enough people believe in it and act on it. And so that's really the question for us, I think, is if we know what's happening, what are we going to do um, to address it? So thank you.